If I can entitle the message this evening, I would entitle it Jesus and Divorce. That's Jesus and Divorce. In this passage, the first 12 verses of Mark chapter 10, the main emphasis is brought out in a question to Jesus from the Pharisees. And the question is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The Pharisees as a whole, they never really had an honest question for Jesus, as though they wanted to learn something new from him. But they would constantly challenge Jesus. They would tempt him, is how it reads, or put Jesus to the test to try to find something wrong with him. And just for the record, they never did. Never did they find anything wrong wrong with Jesus. And Jesus would take their questions and he'd use them to teach the people and to teach us. In their hostility, they were looking for fault. But in his love, he would often answer back with kindness and loving instruction and meekness and humility. That's our Lord. We're going to be covering the first 12 verses, verses 1 through 12 in Mark 10. So let me read them to you. In verse 1, it reads, And he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the further side of the Jordan. And the people resort unto him again, and as was his custom, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? Or their question was, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered or allowed a man to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, He wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. So then they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder or Let no man break in two what God hath joined together. And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. So let's go back and look at these verses again. In verse 1, it reads, And Jesus rose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the further side of the Jordan River. And where Jesus was coming from is mentioned back in Mark chapter 9 as it reads that Jesus and his disciples were coming from Capernaum. And since Jesus was rejected by the religious Jews in Jerusalem, he spent the greater part of his three and a half years of his earthly ministry around the Sea of Galilee and mostly in the city of Capernaum. This was not the great religious center of Israel, but more of where the blue collar working class were, the common folk. There were a great deal of fishermen in this area, such as Peter and Andrew and James and John. Capernaum was the center of Jesus's ministry. Being a large city off the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and even though it was not overly religious, Capernaum had its own synagogue where Jesus would go many times to worship his father and to teach the people. But now in our story, Jesus is heading down to Jerusalem. And this account being the latter portion of the Gospel of Mark, in a timeline, it would indicate that this trip down to Jerusalem would be Jesus' last trip 
before he went to the cross. And he told his disciples plainly back there in Galilee of his sacrifice. Back in Mark 9, 30 through 34, if you want to look there, it reads that they passed through Galilee and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And as we know from our studies, they didn't bring Jesus into the comparison between themselves as far as who should be the greatest. And here he is telling them of his great love for them and his sacrifice. And they were arguing which one of them should be the greatest. It's typical, really. But here in chapter 10, they're now in the area of Judea, but on the further side of the Jordan River. And Jesus, as was his custom, began to teach the people. And I love it that Jesus wanted all people to know about the kingdom of God. And the people would flock from all over Israel just to hear him. And I would put a challenge to you. If Jesus lives in your heart, you should have a decent amount of people wanting to hear what you have to say and about your life in Christ. Because Jesus was for people and not against them. And if people are trying to get away from you all the time because you're just too religious, and maybe a bit condemning, I would say it's time to let Jesus take over and let him run the show and let's see what he does. Jesus would teach the people all the time and people would resort unto him in great numbers. The multitudes would flock to hear Jesus. But along with the common people or those common sinners, the religious Jews would also show up to see what all this commotion was all about. And in verse 2 it says, And the Pharisees, came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him, or you could say it like this, some of the Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered and said unto them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered or allowed a man to write a bill of divorcement and put her away. And just at face value, it really does seem like an innocent question. Is it lawful to divorce? But it says that they were tempting him or that they were trying to trick Jesus. Just like they had asked before, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And they weren't interested in becoming his disciples. They weren't learners. They just wanted something to accuse him of. And here they're trying once again to find fault with Jesus so they might have something to accuse him of when they put him to death. And now the supposed dilemma that the Pharisees thought to have trapped Jesus with was two things. The first, if he said that it was wrong to divorce, he would be speaking against the law of Moses. And that would be considered blasphemy, something that was worthy of death. Legally, it was worthy of death to blaspheme the law of Moses. And the second thing, if he said that divorce was acceptable, then he would have been thought of as being cold-hearted, just as they were. And therefore, he couldn't be the Messiah 
because the Messiah was going to bring all of Israel together and not tear them apart. And so they thought they had trapped Jesus with this question. It's a yes or no question, Jesus. What do you say? In verse 3 it says, And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered or allowed a man to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. In Jesus' day, there were two main schools of thought concerning this controversial subject of divorce. And the first one was of the school of Rabbi Hillel. He held to the lenient and the more popular view. He said that a man could divorce his wife for any reason, for burning his dinner, or even because he didn't find her attractive anymore. That was the popular view. And the second was the school of Rabbi Shammai. I think I'm saying that right. And that was the strict and the more unpopular view. Rabbi Shammai said that divorce was only allowed in the case of adultery. And both views were a social interpretation of the law mentioned from Deuteronomy chapter 24 in verse 1. And that was the law that God had given to Moses. In Deuteronomy 24, 1, it reads in the law, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Rabbi Shammai interpreted that word uncleanness to mean sexual immorality. And he said that was the only valid reason for divorce. But Rabbi Hillel interpreted this word uncleanness to mean any sort of discretion, even to the point of burning his breakfast as being valid grounds for a legal divorce. Listen to some of the teachings of this man of God, Rabbi Hillel, and his very liberal view of divorce. He says, and I quote, if the wife spoiled a dish of food, if she spun in the streets, whatever that means, if she talked to a strange man, if she spoke disrespectfully of her husband's relations in his hearing, or if she was a brawling woman, then he could divorce her. And a brawling woman was defined as a woman whose voice could be heard in the next house. All of those would be grounds for a legal divorce. All of those infractions mentioned would be considered an uncleanness on her part. Another rabbi, Rabbi Akiba, even went to the length of saying that the word uncleanness meant that if a man found a woman who was fairer in his eyes than his wife was, then that would be considered an uncleanness on her part and he could legally put her away. He could lawfully write her this bill of divorcement and send her out of his house. That's terrible. That's terrible. You know, I think that Jesus was sort of poking fun at the Pharisees when he asked them, what did Moses command you? They wanted the legal answer. Is it lawful to divorce? And Jesus, in a roundabout way, he's saying, why don't you ask me what God says about divorce? What did Moses command you? You're only concerned with what Moses says, right? I know you ask because you're simply looking for a loophole in the law so that you can do whatever you want to do and then justify your actions. In Mark 10, 5, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, Moses wrote you this precept. 
And you see, God never intended for any loving union or for any holy matrimony or for any marriage to end in a bitter divorce. See, God only allowed for some legal guidelines in divorce, and that was that bill of divorcement. He allowed it because cold-hearted people were going to divorce anyways. And while divorce is definitely not the unpardonable sin, it certainly is not what God has designed for marriage and what he intended it to be in the first place. Not at all. So now in this conversation, Jesus takes them back further than the law of Moses. He takes them to God's original plan for the relationship between a man and a woman. And he says in verse six, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And they twain or they too shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain. <laughs> That's King James word. They are no more two individuals, but one flesh. See, what Jesus did is that he transitioned them from a talk about divorce to a talk about marriage. The problem wasn't that they didn't understand the law of divorce. The problem was that they didn't understand what God had said about marriage. There's a good reason why Jesus called these men blind Pharisees. And you know, this brings us to a very important question. And I think it's a question that all of you should ask yourselves. And the question is, what then is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of marriage? And I'm hoping that all of you single people here <laughs> want to be married at some point in your lives. And hopefully that's sooner than later. And I didn't say young people. I said single people. <laughs> My mom, she just got married about seven years ago when she was 65 years old. Sorry, mom, but it's it's her third marriage. And I'm thrilled for her, honestly, because it's her first godly marriage. And her husband is actually a Calvary Chapel pastor in Mission Viejo. They pastor a small church in a, in a retirement community. It's going great. So you, <laughs> so you single people should get married sooner than later. Anyway, <laughs> I think uh, you've had enough time to answer the question, even in your own minds, what is the purpose of marriage? And if you said in your heart to get a better tax return, then <laughs> shame on you. Shame on you. But I'm going <laughs> to... Works, but shame on you. I'm going to give you three good reasons for marriage and what the purpose of marriage is and what God intends it to be. And all three of our, uh, these reasons are found in what Jesus had just said to the Pharisees about marriage. The purpose of marriage is one, for companionship. Two, for intimacy. And three, for love. And I like giving this message to a group of singles and I think that mostly everybody here is single. If you're married, raise your hand. All right. <laughs> Giving you guys something to think about. <laughs> so that's uh, once again for companionship, for intimacy, and for love. So the first one, marriage is for companionship. Companionship can be defined as a fellowship or a friendship between two people who like each other very much. 
It's fitting two people together to enjoy one another's company. That's the word companionship. Jesus had said, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And a marriage union between a man and a woman is not some man-made institution. Men didn't evolve into this male-female relationship. But the marriage of a man and a woman is God's design. From the very beginning of creation, God had planned it this way. It's his design. God made them individual male and individual female, but like two separate pieces of the puzzle, God fit them together for companionship or for friendship to keep one another company was his purpose in the garden to be a, a mate and a helpmate <laughs> to one another. Now, the world views marriage as a problem. They refer, they refer to their companion as the old ball and chain. Maybe you've heard that one. Or they say things like, I'm not married, I'm buried. <laughs> <laughs> Famous actress Zsa Zsa Gabor says of marriage, a man in love is incomplete until he's married. Then he's finished. That's the world's view. But God's design of marriage is a tremendous blessing. If you're married, say amen. <laughs> I heard you in the front, amen. That's my wife. Good job, honey. I told her to say that. In Proverbs 18.22, it reads, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor from the Lord. And the same verse in the New Living Translation reads, The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from God. And despite what people say about children these days, as if children are more of a problem than they're worth, God says that children are a blessing from the Lord. In Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, it says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now, the first two people that God had placed upon the face of the earth were a man and his wife. God formed the man from the dust of the earth. In his own image, God created him. God created them. But the woman, she wasn't made of the dust of the earth. She was taken from the man. The man was put into a deep sleep. It was this surgery that he had to undergo. And God took from the side of the man and from there he formed the woman. And it's been said that God didn't take her from his foot so he can't kick her or he can't abuse her. And God didn't take her from the top of his head so she can't rule over him. But from his side so she could come back to his side. Once again, under his arm for protection and close to his heart for companionship. And another word for companionship is friendship. Your wife or your husband should be your best friend the one that you trust the most, the one that you root for and you cheer for that they might succeed in everything they do. The wife is speaking of her husband in Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 16, and she says, His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. O daughters of Jerusalem. 
So the first purpose of marriage is for companionship. Now, the second reason or the second purpose for marriage is for intimacy. Jesus said that a man is to cleave unto his wife. This is quite the opposite of divorce or of a man leaving his wife. In fact, God says that you're to leave your parents and cleave to your wife. To cleave is to find comfort in one another. And this goes way beyond just the friendship aspect. In fact, the marriage relationship is the most intimate of all relationships that two individuals can share together. You cannot experience a more loving, intimate relationship with any other person on the face of the earth more than you can with your own wife or with your own husband. Homosexual partners cannot enjoy the blessing of God in their relationships like God has designed for the married couple, the man and the woman, the husband and wife. Two people living together or living just as boyfriend and girlfriend in a sexual relationship, they cannot be blessed of the Lord like the married couple can be and is. I believe that a good part of a healthy marriage relationship is a good, healthy sexual relationship. But within the marriage only, in Hebrews 13, 4, it says marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled. That means that God designed the husband and the wife for this privileged intimacy. They were designed for intimacy with one another. He's great. <laughs> He's a great God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, I'll read verse 4 out of the NIV. I like how it reads. In verse 5 out of the NLT. I know you scholars know those acronyms there or whatever you call them. Anyway, verse 4, the wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. And in verse 5, it reads, Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That's just right there in the scripture. It tells us how we should be intimate with our husband or, or wife. See, sex is not just for procreation so that we can just have babies and repopulate the earth and that's it. But sex is a blessing from God to be enjoyed within the marriage relationship. And I doubt that Adam and Eve had any problem enjoying the intimacy of their love in the garden before the fall. And it was totally pure. Marriage is for intimacy. Now, the third thing I wanted to mention is love. The purpose for marriage is for love. Jesus said, and they two shall be one flesh. So then they are no more two separate individuals, but one flesh. And in the marriage relationship, the husband and the wife have become one together in love. And they continue to grow as one flesh. So much so that they start acting like one another. If you guys know married couples and you observe them for some time, they do. Any couples who have been married for a long time in a loving relationship, know exactly what I mean. You begin to talk like each other and you uh, begin to like the same foods and the same sports and you both become Laker fans and that's when things are going really good. And you love to serve together, growing in the Lord together, 
and the two have become one. You know, these are, these are great points. This is what it means to be in love. My wife, she's my friend. She's my companion. She's my lover. Sorry. Don't, don't tell Pastor Chuck that I said that. He, didn't, he don't want to hear that kind of stuff. But we're in love with each other. We are. Does anyone here know what it's like to be in love? You know what it's like to be in love? <laughs> you should try it. <laughs> you know, there's a legal contract that I have that's submitted to the state of California. It's a licensed contract that was sanctioned by a ceremony along with certain vows and promises. And it was a signed document by myself. I signed it and my significant other, she signed it also with two witnesses and an officiant overseeing the whole thing. That's, that's my marriage certificate. The legal document that shows that I'm married. But this legal document should only prove what I had purposed in my heart when I had asked her 12 years ago, down on both knees, will you marry me? <laughs> it's so much more than a piece of paper that holds us together. That piece of paper is important too. But it's our love for one another. I'm in love with my wife. I am. I'm in love with my wife. And she loves me too. I know it. She told me earlier when I got home from work. I believe her. It was a loving attraction that brought us together. And it's a loving commitment to one another and to the Lord that keeps us together. The certificate and the ring that proves that we're married in God's eyes. But... Honestly, there's no running away. There will be no certificate of divorce that I hand to my wife. There won't. Even when times get rough. You know why? I'll tell you why. <laughs> this is good. Because of Jesus' love for me. That's why. That's why I would never divorce my wife. Because Jesus loves me. Because of his great commitment to me. That's why. It's his love for me that reminds me when I'm not right to love my wife. I'm to love my wife more than anyone else in the entire world. Even more than my kids. They'll leave someday. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> and they'll cleave to their own husbands and their own wife. And I can honestly say that I love my wife more today than ever before in our 12 short years of marriage. But my, my love for my wife, it needs to continue to mature into a beautiful demonstration of what true love is. And when we're both old and gray, our love should have by then blossomed into something glorious for all to see what true love is. I want to read you a portion from a wedding ceremony that I had performed back in December of 2010. And after they exchange rings and we've sealed the ceremony or they have with a kiss. I like to encourage the newly married couple in this manner. It goes like this. It's a, uh, well, let me just read it to you. It says, well, as husband and wife, I want to give you both an admonition, a charge, a call to duty. Peter, God has charged you to love your wife. Peter was the husband. In your marriage, that is your number one responsibility. You are to even be like the Lord Jesus Christ in this. You are to lay down your life for Jasmine. And as God does not condemn you, Peter, 
but continues to love you and build you up. You are to be gracious to your wife. You are to build her up. Your number one responsibility to her is to love her. And Jasmine, God has charged you to submit yourself to your own husband. In your marriage, that is your number one responsibility. And at times, God may seem a little difficult for us to figure out. But we as his bride continue to trust him for his care. And as Peter's bride, Jasmine, your number one responsibility is to submit to his leadership in all things. At another wedding, I, I like to do this charge at every wedding. At another wedding, I had done uh, this same thing. It was down in Laguna Beach at the top of the cliffs there where they were having their wedding. And when I told the bride that she was to submit to her own husband, the husband yelled, oh, yeah. <laughs> And I said, wait, I'm not done yet. And I said, you are to submit yourselves one to another. That's what the Bible says. You are to submit yourselves one to another. If you do this, you will have harmony in your home. In Mark 10, 9, Jesus said, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Or as it reads in the New Living Translation, let no one split apart what God hath joined together. Jesus tells the Pharisees, your concepts of love are majorly faulty. Your certificate of divorce only shows that you don't know what love is. In America, we as the church speak out against the homosexual problem. And we speak out against men and women advocating gay rights. And we speak out against our schools teaching alternative sexual preferences or sexual orientation in same-sex relationships. And we speak out against the military's don't ask, don't tell policy on homosexuals. And we should. Uh, we should be telling men and women to turn from their sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and for the hope of eternal life. But guess what the percentage of the population of homosexuals in America is? Take a guess. What's the percentage of the population of homosexuals in America? It's between 1 and 2%. That's it. Across America. It's probably more in California. So based on 100 people, maybe one or two people out of that group is professing some sort of homosexual tendencies or actions. Now guess the divorce rate in America, across the board. What's the divorce rate? It's 50% across the board. That means out of every 100 couples that get married in the United States, 50 of those couples end that relationship in a divorce. And I heard one statistic that in California, the divorce rate is 80%. That means out of every 100 couples that get married in California, 80 of those couples split apart what God has joined together. Why? Why do you think the divorce problem is so much greater than even the problem of homosexuality? I want to preach against sin, preach against divorce. I believe that people go into marriage with wrong concepts. They think this is for me. I want to get married or I want to marry her because of what she can do for me or I want him to take care of me I want her to adore me and feed me grapes and, <laughs> and cater to me and people marry because they think mainly of the benefit to self Walt Disney has given us this picture of marriage that's unrealistic 
honestly, little kids grow up thinking this way. There's this prince on this white horse and he's sweeping the young Cinderella off her feet to make her his bride to live happily ever after in their castle together. No problems, no worries, just bliss. But real life marriage is tough. It is. You're putting two sinners together to work things out so that they can think and behave themselves as one person. That's a challenge. That's a process. That's a continual laying down of our lives for one another. Remember how I spoke in the beginning of this message of Jesus telling his disciples of his own death and resurrection? Well, this whole portion of Scripture is speaking of sacrificial love. It's the book of Mark. He's the servant of all. He's speaking about laying down his life. It's the theme throughout the gospel. He says at the end of chapter 9, if your eye offends you, then cut it off. And if your hand or your foot offends, then cut it off, for it is better to enter into life maimed than to have your whole body cast into hell. And what he means by that is being an offense to others is something that Jesus thinks of as being very important and that he says, it's better for you to take these drastic measures than for you to be an offense. And that's harsh language, honestly. It is. But he's very serious. It's important that we love one another, that we serve one another, that we lay down our lives for one another. You are a servant, Christian. Sometimes it's easy to come and serve in a fellowship. <laughs> but get married and serve this sinner that you call your spouse day in and day out for years. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> you know, if we walked around the South Coast Plaza and we asked the young single people why they would want to get married, how many of them do you think would say, because I want to serve my spouse? I want to lay down my life for them. I want to give my whole life in sacrificial love to my husband or to my wife in a lifelong commitment of sacrificial love. Maybe 30% of the people would say that. Out of those 30% of married couples in California that didn't get a divorce, how many of those marriages do you think really honor God in sacrificial love? We're a wreck, huh? We're a wreck. As society, we really don't understand the picture of love as Jesus Christ has portrayed it in the Bible. I think that the divorce rate proves it. It does. I know this doesn't sound good, but do you think that you can love like Jesus loved? Do you think that you can love like Jesus did in the laying down of his life? If you want to find out, get married. <laughs> get married. And give a lifelong commitment to your husband or to your wife in sacrificial love. People need to see that. I'm being very serious. People need to see that. Honestly, how many couples do you know who are totally on fire for Jesus? And they demonstrate it by this continual sacrifice for one another. Probably not enough. Verse 10, And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And you know, Jesus, he did give an allowance for divorce. Am I going over my time? You guys want to hear the rest? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Should have shortened it up. 
<laughs> it's good. You'll be glad you stayed. Jesus did give an allowance for divorce in Matthew 19, verse 9. Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And Jesus said, if there's an adulterous relationship, if one of the partners cheats on the other married partner, then you can divorce. But I want to tell you something. I think it's better to forgive. Honestly. It's better to forgive than to divorce. And it's tough. It hurts. I believe that the, I've heard this, that the death of one of the faithful partners in a marriage is easier to handle than an adulterous relationship in the marriage. But I still say it, it's better to forgive than to divorce. And to prove this point, all you need to do is look at your own sin and the sin that you've committed against the Lord, that spiritual adultery in your life against your bridegroom, you being the bride of Christ. You say you love him, and sometimes you act as though he doesn't even exist. And do you want him to divorce you? Or would you rather that he forgave you for all of your sins and that he continued to love you as though you had never done anything wrong at all? Isn't that our hope in him? That he forgives us in such a manner? And so shouldn't we forgive one another? Be gracious to one another. In Ephesians 4.32 it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. We are to love one another. We're to be patient with one another. We're to forgive one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Total sacrificial love. That's our Lord. This companionship, this intimacy and love should be exercised between the husband and the wife first. That should be the place that people see it the most in the marriage relationship. So it is very sad that so many marriages fall apart because it doesn't honor the Lord like it should. So if you're single or you're young, I would say that your your greatest relationship really should be with your parents. And if you're an adult, if you're a single adult, it should be your parents first, then your family, then your work, then your neighbors, then your friends, they fall down in there somewhere. <laughs> and then you're to love your enemies. In sacrificial love, we're to do this. And I would say it's because of the hardness of your heart that you're always trying to get rid of people and throw them away when they're not perfect. But it's so much better to love and to forgive and show mercy. And in closing, I have one short story. I wanted to share this story of my friend who had told, told me of a counseling session that he had with a man who wanted a divorce from his wife. And the man came in, he said, I, I just can't stand her. Everything she does bothers me. Why did I marry her in the first place? And my friend said, what matters most is what God says you should do. And it's written in Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And he said, well, she doesn't even act like my wife. She acts like, like my neighbor. I, I don't think we're going to make it. And my friend said in Matthew 22, 39, it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> and he said, man, she's worse than a neighbor. She's like my enemy. She's, 
She's terrible. She acts like my enemy. And my friend faithfully pointed him to the scripture in Matthew 5.44, where Jesus says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Good counsel. We are to love in long-term relationships, laying down our lives for one another, just as Christ Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you for this message where you minister to our hearts and we see it just in a practical marriage relationship of what true sacrificial love is. And we pray, I Lord, I want to pray for every single person here that they would get married <laughs> if it's your will and that they would have godly marriages and that they would be in love with you and they would demonstrate Christ's likeness with the man laying down his life and she would demonstrate the picture of the church in love with Jesus Christ and they would model your relationship to your bride the church in their marriages. Lord, please give us more marriages that honor you so that we can show the world how great you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name.